Well, having said that, let's come back home and discuss activities lined up to mark Nigeria's 64th independence celebration. Yesterday, there was an interdenominational prayer uh, that was preceded by uh, a Jumat prayer by the Muslim faithfuls as well. And tomorrow, the D-Day, there would be a procession at the Eagle Square, uh, which we hear is also supposed to be headlined by a statewide broadcast by President Bola Metinibu. But let's also take a listen to an academic this year, uh, this morning, Professor Abiodun Adeni, the Dean, School of Postgraduate Studies at the Bayes University, Abuja, who would join us now to discuss our reflection on Nigeria's journey thus far, progress since colonial rule, and a hope that has been hinged on the renewed hope mandate of the current administration. Hello, good morning to you, Prof. Can you hear me? Hello, Prof. Good morning. Can you hear me? I can hear you clearly. Very I hope you can hear me too. Yes, sir. Welcome to the program. We're happy to have you join us this morning. Uh, let's get straight into the discussion, particularly from the angle of what many perceive as tension. Tomorrow, October 1st, before now, was just Independence Day. Now, it is being greeted by some rumors of the nationwide planned protest. Having that in hindsight, do you think that this would somewhat change tomorrow's agenda? I don't think so. If government engages very well, um, 64 years uh, post-independent um, Nigeria is not a joke. It's something that should be officially celebrated, uh, like we have always done in the last uh, 64 years. And of course, um, with uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's uh, disposition, um, I do not see him uh, detracting from um, that trajectory. So, yes, there will be celebration. But of course, I also believe protesters, uh, what they have told us so far, I do not also imagine that it will obliterate uh, the importance of um, Nigeria at 64. So overall, we might see um, celebrations and protestation um, going in Paris Passu. But the important thing is that it should not degenerate um, into violence, as we often know um, that uh, something that we often acknowledge as a consequence of um, what should have been a peaceful uh, protest, especially with our last experience um, with uh, the end um, hunger protests, as the case could be. Now, Prof, you had talked about the historic significance of 64 years post-colonial rule, but the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Senator George Akume, did say that these celebrations would be somewhat low-keyed owing to the current hardship. Now, how do we juxtapose such a historic milestone with current day reality in reflecting on how far we've come and projecting how far we want to go. Yeah, if you look at um, the way nations around the world are portrayed, are portrayed with respect to values, um, in the United States, we talk about freedom, um, equality, and of course, um, happiness. In the UK, we talk about tradition, uh, we talk about discipline, welfare regime. In Japan, we talk about discipline. We talk about tradition. And of course, in France, largely we talk about style and tradition. In Nigeria, what do we talk about? Oftentimes, we talk about resilience. You know, resilience, um, resilience against um, some of our, our many travails. You know, uh, over the years, Nigerian, Nigerians have emerged as some of the most rep resilient people. Uh, people who still manage to be happy despite um, all um, their travels and triumph and try and trials, as the case could be. Um, yes, we're in that time, 64 years um, after independence, and of course, those that that times are even worsening now because everything seems to be going south. You know, you can also trust once again against that background. You can trust again that Nigerians will pull through and they will find happiness in the midst of um, tough realities of existence. And that has been our mainstay, really. And that has been our staying power, even though we know this is not right. 
So I'm confident that, yes, um, difficult times, no doubt, uh, we'll just continue to push and we can probably, probably find levels of redemption um, through especially good leadership. Good leadership exemplified in um, sacrificial um, leadership, exemplified in uh, leading by examples, exemplified in people doing um, what they're asking others to do, and of course not doing what they're asking others to do. By the time we begin to see leadership by example, uh, where people consider others before self, where people become less aggrandizing, I'm very sure that the people who will key in will be much more hopeful and our values may begin to move from just resilience to patriotism, to nationalism, you know, to faith um, in modern Nigeria. Now, Prof, one thing you would agree with me and many Nigerians would also uh, uh, judge to is the fact that beyond our resilience, we have also been dubbed as a nation that should pride itself in its unity and diversity. But the challenge has been about certain groups crying about marginalization and perceived exclusion from our common wealth, particularly the Niger Delta, the Southeast, where there are still agitations in some sort. How does Nigeria at 64 reflect on this unity and diversity as a strength other than a divisive factor? Yeah. Well, if you can see, hear me, because I can see that the network is shaking. Um, there's no nation in the world that is completely homogeneous. Um, what matters most of the time is the management of homogeneity. Even nations that are theoretically homogeneous you know, sometimes fall into strife because of differences, you know, um, because of the dynamism of human existence, especially when they're in a collective. If you look at the United States, for instance, it's an immigrant society. Uh, we are witnesses over there uh, to a conflation of ethnicities, nationalities. But over the years, they've been able to harness this, managing their diversity very well uh, through the instrument of the law, of regulations, you know, and a commitment, you know, to the American dream. You know, um, that is a level that I imagine that we need to get to in Nigeria so that we can be much more bonded. We are diverse, no doubt, but there's, there can be strength in that diversity, you know, um, if we are properly guided. You know, if we are meant, meant to understand that, yes, we belong to different ethnicities, but at the same time, we are bonded not just by our humanity, but by our geography, our common history, our related culture, you know, and of course, a shared dream of building a nation that will be very respectable, re respected and reputable in the committee of nations. Now, Prof, we'll come to the use of the rule of law in strengthening this unity and diversity and ensuring that there is justice in our society. But first of all, let's also talk about a movement that is somewhat gaining momentum. There has been calls even at the legislative chamber by some sections for the creation of more states, a change in the rotation of power, and the tenor of the presidency to allow for more inclusion. Do you think that this is the right step in achieving a federal character in Nigeria, that every Nigerian region is seen to be viable of being at the leadership at the point of the presidency? Well, that's a very good uh, question, no doubt. You know, but you see, na uh, people will continue to agitate when they feel um, a high sense of marginalization a high sense of exclusion from the peace center of the nation's economy. And of course, we cannot discount that, you know, over time. Um, if people feel included, no matter how distant they are, you know, no matter where they are located, no matter where they are, how remote um, they are placed, they wouldn't necessarily be bothered about um, asking for more states, a further division of our entities, our regions, or our zones. You know, but of course, because of um, the uh, continuous aggrandizement by individuals, by groups, you know, invested in interest groups that regard the nation, you know, as a place where they should continue to collect rents that feed on the nation, collective patrimony, um, that sense of agitation will continue to grow. But how do we remedy this? We can remedy this, sim remedy this uh, simply by growing our democracy, which is about inclusion and integration, one, then two, by growing an institution, our institutions, which is about structures and system, um, to make 
um, the ability of the state to respond to the needs and aspirations of the people very seamless, you know. And of course, we do know that institutions can also be grown by individuals, individuals who are well-meaning, committed to the greater good of the people and not to the South, you know. But it's, this um, commitment should not just be knee-jerk or episodic, but should be, and not just in pronouncements, you know, or in what they say and not what they do. You know, it should be a painstaking, worked over time, consistent with how we understand nation building to, to be. Nation building is work in progress, but we need to see that work actually progressing, not making one, not making two progress to say today, so to say, and of course you make um, one must one pro uh, progress backward. It means that you are just not moving. It's all it's all motion and no movement, you know. So um, I think it's all cannot it cannot be weaved around uh, the question of leadership. Um, which is supposed to galvanize the populace, especially when that leader is seen as a hero, um, when that leader is selfless, um, when that leader is committed to the greater good, not the, the good of himself, his family, his friends, not cronism, not nepotism, not ethnicism, tribalism, you know, or, or religious bigotry, as the case could be. Yes, Nigeria is multi-ethnic, and of course, the antidote to ruling or to governing in the multi-ethnic society is to rise above uh, classifiers and divides and present yourself as somebody in love of the majority, not just um, the love of a mi minority represented in your, um, your narrow origin, your narrow religion, or um, your narrow interests, as the case could be. Now, many will talk about our current leader under the administration of President Bola Metinibu, who often a time has been adjudged as a hero of democracy, going as far back as his Nadeko days. But in recent times, one of the historic achievements of this administration, I would think, is the fight for local government autonomy. That fear of government in 64 years has been somewhat relegated to the backdrop. But despite obtaining a judgment from the Supreme Court, the implementation of that autonomy in having elections that Nigerians would regard as being credible has been marred by a lot of reactions to the recent conduct of local government elections in Nigeria. How do we foster this desire by a leader that has taken a step to achieve this democracy we dream for and having institutions that align with the vision? The world that of have been really is what I also... Um, mentioned earlier and of course it has resonated you know in a different way brilliantly in your question you know all arms of government especially in our kind of environment weren't created you know for the sake of just creation they were created to achieve a purpose and that's why we have local government local governments are meant to reach you know the smallest of the people the minutest of the people consistent with um, the drive for inclusion, you know, for integration um, anywhere in the world. In the United States, they are called counties, you know. In Nordic, Scandinavian countries, they are called communes. In the United, um, uh, United Kingdom, for instance, they are called um, what councils, you know. And of course, in some of these countries, many of these countries, they do not even know, um, they, don't, they don't bother about the larger um, tier of government, the federal government or the state government. They've got no business with those tiers of government. They are concerned only with the government that is closest to them, represented in the councils, the communes, the counties, or so to say, as, as you may want uh, to call it. You know, and of course, we fashioned our president, our system after the American presidential system, you know, which is not complete anyway, but at least the one we have is manageable. But typical of our character to deviate from set rules, uh, to deviate, you know, um, from theoretical prescriptions, we have deviated over the years, undermining uh, the local government, you know, forgetting that they have some primary roles, you know, management of parks, uh, repair of minor roads, arteries, and all of that. And it has gravitated to uh, a situation where you have um, their funds, you know, even being hijacked at the state level. And... Over time, we've had several governments, but I think President Buhari tried this, um, you know, by coming up with an executive order, giving them independence. We have also seen what President Bola Metinibu has done you know, through the Supreme Court. 
But even even at that, we are still seeing, you know, conscious attempt, you know, uh, of government, particularly the state, to undermine um, this design. And of course, we have seen the result: the industri industrialization, you know, neglect of communities, you know, uh, permitting banditry, you know, kidnapping, insurgency, and all such vices to thrive, you know. So, what more do we need to tell us that it is time, you know, we strengthen? this tier of government as it closes to the people and as the most significant in terms of uh, driving home or bringing home a uh, development, you know, uh, close to the people as much as we can imagine. I don't just know. And that's the point we're making. Why do things not work here? You know, um, things will work only when we um, ramp up our commitment and our commitment is not going to fall from the sky. It's not something um, that is situated in the atmosphere, it rests with us. But again, it comes back to the question of leadership. Leadership has to provide the drive you know, by being conscientious, by not shacking responsibilities, by a uh, determination to leave legacy, legacy that will ensure stability and sustainability for the, for the good of not just our present generation, but generations uh, that are yet unborn. Well, thank you, Professor Adeni. Please stay with us. We're also having a three-way conversation. We're also going to be joined by a third party at this point. And I'm talking about Mr. Gideo Joe, who also joins us virtually to lend his thoughts on Nigeria's 64th independence anniversary. Hello, Mr. Gideo. Good morning to you. Hello, Mr. Gideo Joe. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. I can hear you. Happy New Week. Same to you, and a happy independence in advance. Same to you. Now, I don't know if you've been following our conversation with Prof. Adeni, but it's on the significance of our 64th independence anniversary. In your perspective, do you think that our founding fathers who fought for this independence would be proud of where we are as a nation, should they be privy to some of the challenges and teaching issues that we're continuing to, to grapple with despite being independent for over 64 years? Well, the founding fathers, I don't know whether we should commend them or whether they will be happy with us. Uh, if you look at some of the expressions of the founding fathers, the Inamdiazikwes, the Awolowos, the Tafabalewas, and Amadou Belu, uh, it would seem that they never even believed in one united entity called Nigeria. Uh, one of them said Nigeria is just a geographical expression. And uh, so, so it, 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 sometimes we, is, we suffer selective amnesia that the, the, those who fathered this independence were more or less ethnic jingoists. They were not nationalists in the true sense of it. Uh, if you look at the elections that were held pre-independence, everybody was, was about their region. Uh, the MPC was more concerned about northern region. The NCNC was more interested in what happened in the southeast and south-south. And then the APG, uh, um, Action Co I, 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 It may seem as though Mr. G Day's network has some glitch in it. We're hoping that once that network connection can be more stable, we'll have him reiterate his thoughts. Now, I'll come back to you, Professor Adeni. Listening to Mr. Gido Ojo uh, take us down history lane, talking about the perspective of our founding fathers not being really nationalist, uh, 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 but having some egoistic agenda. Do you agree? Hello, Prof. Are you with us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Prof. Welcome back to the conversation. No, this is Gide Ojo. All right, Mr. Gide, your network, we lost you for a minute there. You were taking us through history and reeling out our founding fathers in terms of their agenda in party perspective and for the ethnicity that they had in their minds as against nationality. Can you pick up from there? So what I'm saying is that when you look at the context of the nationalist struggle. Uh, our founding fathers were not homogeneous in their thoughts 
And that's why even when you look back in history, political history of Nigeria, when the South, Southern Nigeria were ready for independence in 1957, the North said, we are not ready for independence. So they were not speaking with one voice. They were just, you know, cacophony. Remember the, the it was 1956 when uh, Anthony Enauro uh, made that, that um, move for Nigeria to become independent by 1957. The rest of the North said, we were not ready. We were not ready, don't, don't rush us into independence. So it tells you the story that Nigeria has a faulty foundation. Our national, our, our so-called founding fathers were not quite homogeneous and they were quite disparate in their thoughts. They were more like uh, ethnic jingoists, in my own opinion. They were more interested in welfare and well-being of their different groups. And people were thinking less about the nation. And that was why, you know, Agui and Rossi, when he took over the reign of government in 1967, uh, decided to introduce unitary government. Because even our party system was ethno-religious in nature. You hear of United uh, Middle Belt Congress, UMBC. You hear of Northern People's Congress. M MPC. So I, I, everybody was just fighting, looking at Nigeria from the prism of their own ethnic and religious uh, reg uh, viewpoint. But when the uh, Agui Rossi decided to introduce unitarism or unitary system, uh, it backfired. And when you look at the fact that by 1970, between 1976 and 1979, when we were working on return to civil rule, after 13 years of military rule, they decided to jettison the thoughts of our founding father. Remember, at independence, we, we ran parliamentary system of government. And under parliamentary system of government, you win election from your, from your constituency. You are not a presidential candidate. There was no presidential candidate. You win election into the, into the assembly, and then if your party happens to be in the majority, you can imagine to be uh, prime minister. And that was how Tafa Balewa became prime minister because of the, alliance, the working alliance between MPC and NCNC. And that was why when, when uh, Tafa Balewa was chosen as prime minister, Ayin uh, 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 was given the role of a uh, governor general or the governor or president, ceremonial president of Nigeria. So when you look at the fact that what the founding father bequeathed to us at independence was not nationalistic in outlook, that was why when, we were, when, the, when the drafters of 1979 constitution was drafting it, they, they were trying to foster us and merge us into a nationhood. That was when they said there would be no more uh, ethno-religious political parties. That was when everything became na national in nature. Uh, and, and people have said that that in itself has become counterproductive. Because today, you look at 19 political parties that we have, you can say that only very few of them are national in outlook. The All Progressive Grand Alliance, for instance, has remained more or less like an Igbo party. It has always been like an Igbo party uh, until the merger of AD. Alliance for Democracy was viewed as Yoruba party, uh, party of the Southwest people. And that was where its strength lies. It won the sixth six governorship position in 1999. So what I'm saying invariably is that we, have, we are still trying to experiment with different modes of governance thinking that we will want to strike one that can best suit us. I don't know, people have been talking about um, what they call homegrown democracy. Homegrown democracy. They say, okay, parliamentary system that we run from 1960 to 1966, January 15, was bequeathed to us by our colonial fathers. That's the British or the United Kingdom. Then the presidential system that we have been running since 1979 was bequeathed to us by the Americans. And we have not perfected that of the system. In fact, recently, 
as late as last year, people were even talking about us going back to a parliamentary system of government because they felt it's, it's going to cost us less to run a parliamentary system. Now, Mr. Joe, I haven't listened to the comparisons between the teaching challenges of Nigeria post-independence. Now, pre-independence, it seems as though these challenges have still manifested themselves in current day Nigeria. I don't know if you're aware of the debates between Northern and Southern senators in view of a constitution review. There is a disagreement about regionalism. Whilst many believe that to achieve a more united Nigeria, there needs to be sharing of power to all regions. Some are conversing for the creation of more states. Others are also looking at the rotation of the tenor of presidency. In your perspective, are this still a reoccurrence of our teaching challenges? Or do you think that going through the, the route of regionalism will be able to overcome the need for a homegrown system of democracy? Well, if that question is, is still for me, I will say that regionalism will not help us at this stage. How do you want to collapse the state structure that have been there since 1970, since 1976 or there? 1979. 1979. We started having state creation. In, in fact, 1963, that's when we had the Middle Belt. You remember the Midwest. We had Midwest carved out of the South, uh, uh, carved out of Western region in 1960, 1963. Then we have, uh, by 1976, we created uh, 13 new states, which led us into 1979, uh, where we had 19, 19 states um, that contested, uh, under which we had uh, the 1979 to 1983 governance structure. From 19, we moved to 21. From 21, we moved to, uh, we moved to 30. From 30, we moved to 36. Now, how do you collapse these state structures that have been there for approximately 30 years it's not going to be that easy then issue of rotational presidency i am fully in support of that because you see the whole essence of uh, federalism is that um federalism talks about power sharing between the federal and the constituent units when you and part of our federal structure is the introduction of principles of uh, of power um, introduction of the principle of federal character federal character principle and quota system now i believe that we can alter, alternate uh, power rotation between the north and the south which is what is actually happening right now because when you look at 19 from 25 years history from 1970, uh, 1999 but to 2007, we had a Yoruba person, a Southerner in the person of Mobasanjo. When he left, he brought in a Northerner in the person of uh, Umaru Musashe Uyadwa, uh, Umaru Musa Yadwa. But for death, Yadwa will have done eight years, and power will have shifted back to the South. But unfortunately, because of the death of Yadwa, uh, good Lord Jonathan took over. And that was why the North said, no, they will not allow good luck to serve another time. And they voted them up in 2015, which is what led to the emergence of Buhari in 2015. Buhari has done eight years. When he wanted to foster, uh, when, when Buhari wanted to force the North, Ahmed Lawa, from Yobe State, to take over from him. Remember, we were told that the President Buhari anointed uh, and uh, supported Ahmed Lawa to succeed him. That was why the APC governors went to meet Mr. President last year and said, no, don't do this. Power should shift to the south. And that was the mistake the PDP made that cost it the presidency in 2023 because they decided to now give ticket to Atiku Abaka, who is also from the north. And that was why a majority of the people uh, Using the instrument of the behind the, the emergence of Shwadubola Metinubu, including people like uh, uh, the President of the Senate, Nangoswe Akpabio, who sacrificed his, uh, his presidential ambition to support the emergence of uh, Shwadubola Metinubu. So we can have that kind of constitutional arrangement that will now say 
power should shift from the north to the south. So when it gets to the part of the north, north can now have a primary election amongst them to say, okay, northwest have had dominance. Let power shift to north central or let power shift to northeast. You understand? Then when is the turn of South Southern presidency? You can say Yorubas have had Obasanjo, they have had Tinubu. Let somebody from Southeast, who is uh, of Igbo instruction, become the next president. president. Then at the state level, at the state level, if you don't have this rotational principle, you will find out that some ethnic group will never be governor of their state. And I can give you multiple examples. Much in, like we see the case in, in Benway State. We'll, we'll come back to this in a, in a bit. Much like we see the case in Benway State where a certain ethnic group has been yes, governor the chief, for long. The chief dominated the politics of Benway. The Galas dominated that of Kogi. The uh, uh, Abel Kuta Ijebu dominated that of uh, Ogun State. The Bado mm -hmm. Momosho dominated that of Oyo State. And like that, in many states, if you don't have that rotational principle, power will never get to people of Okeogu in, in Oyo State because they are, they, are, they, they are voting minority. The same thing with Yewa people in, this, in Ogun State. They are voting minority. So power will continue to oscillate between the Jebus and the Egbas in Ogun State. So what we are saying is that for purposes of equity, justice, and fairness, we can have something in the constitution that recognizes power rotation so that at least sense of belonging. You know, sometimes it's not even for economic reason, it's just for a bragging right. You want to be to have a sense of belonging that my tribe is the person that is is governing. I mean, Tinubu is there today. Are the Yorubans not crying? Have we have it better? Do we have special privilege under the presidency of the Yoruba? the same price in the market. Uh, we, we are not getting any, any commodity at a discount because we are from the same ethnic group with the president. But sometimes a motive, we, we say, oh, it's, it's our man, it's our person that is there. So maybe in a way he can influence some projects to the southwest. As a president, he can nominate people into positions as he has done. People have said that there is globalization of the economy of Nigeria now. Or some people have even accused him of legalization, that most of his uh, key appointments are from Lagos State or from the Southwest. But maybe that's the privilege that you have, having a Yoruba person yes. as a president. But for majority of citizens of the Yoruba race, we are not having it funny, even though we are the one that produced the president. But that sense of equity, justice, and fairness must be there. Sense of political inclusion. That's why there is agitation in the South East today. Because they are asking the question, if you don't zone, if you don't do rotation, how can a Nibo man become president of Nigeria? Nigeria. Now, Mr. It's, it's, Mr. Jide, I'll hold your thoughts there. Just, just stay with us. Now, we have largely discussed Nigeria post-independence from the angle of political independence. Now, I don't know if Professor Adeni is still with us, but having listened to Mr. Ojo, he has harped on the need for a homegrown solution, citing the fact that we borrowed the parliamentary system from the British, did not perfect it, borrowed the presidential uh, system from the Americans, did not perfect it. But in the angle of economic independence, it almost feels as though Nigeria has been accused of going cap in hand to beg some of our colonial master for AIDS. Do you think that Nigeria is... Uh, economically independent <laughs> no nation can be economically independent you know if you look at it in real terms um every nation um, uh, uh, has a level of dependence on another in the, consistent with the times that we are in a time of global changes which some people like to call um globalization the world has become increasingly decentered and of course you want to at benefit, you know, from the expertise of other nations, you know. Um, we have United States now as the strongest economy in the world, even though it's been challenged by China, but it has reasons to outsource many things, you know, to other countries. We have transnational companies, multinational companies, having branches in different parts of the world. It just shows that we are mutually dependent. But the point we need to emphasize is that mm -hmm. When we are sheepish, behaving like lily putters in the process, when we are not respected because we practically produce nothing, 
that it puts us at a level uh, that any nation should not uh, be in, you know. Um, of course, even political independence, we do not have it yet. Yes, we are. Um, what we have is what some political scientists have described as flag independence. In terms of politics, uh, we still depend a lot, you know, on Western powers. And in recent times, we're even moving to the East um, for directions, you know, directly um, or indirectly. But again, I know that there may not be anything wrong with our presidential system. I've made the argument severally that our problem is actually attitudinal as against constitutional. You know, if we are re-energized, if our values change, if our behavior in government change for the good of the people, I will say it's for the umpteenth time, you know, we can change um, the narrative as the case could be. And of course, um, own, yeah, homegrown democracy, that what um, we, we are probably just saying that our presidential system uh, should be much more original, we should be much more creative about it. We know nations that we admire in inter-global circles that are not necessarily, um, you know, they're not, they, they haven't obviously copied another system of government like we have done. Dubai is an admired country or admired location. Um, it's a theocratic state. But in terms of economy, it is doing very well. Saudi Arabia is a theocratic state largely. But in terms of, of economy, they are miles ahead of us. You know, China is, is um, it's not a democracy, it's an autocracy. But economically, it's admired, you know. And of course, it has a relationship with different parts of the world on account of its exemplary performance in the last uh, couple of decades, you know. And go to other Asian countries and countries in the Oceania too. Yeah, Malaysia is doing excellently well. India, I used to a third of the world poor used to be in India those days, but not anymore. You know, technologically they have advanced. India has a capacity to manufacture its airplane as we speak, but they are not doing so because it's cheaper for them to buy from from Boeing or from Bombardier. You know, as the case could be because of economics. You know, it tells us that um, with conscientious leadership once again, you know, we can um, you know achieve. Uh, we want to achieve. And of course, yes, we can tweak our presidential system as it is. I'm, I'm not going to say that we should go back to parliamentary system, no. Um, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with our presidential system. It's just about those who are operating it because um, they are prebendal, they are partials in their attitude to public um, pu public uh, resources. And what, are, what can we tweak about it? First, we, we should think, we probably think seriously about um, a bicameral legislature probably too expensive for us, we can make it unicameral. Um, and of course, my colleague has talked about rotational presidency. Yes, that may not necessarily be ingrained or imputed into the Constitution, but it can continue as it is if there is understanding. Usually, it can remain at the level of convention, at the level of mutual understanding, respecting the rights of the other people, you know, and to express uh, their desire to belong. Because nation building, it's not about tangible you know, alone. It also includes the intangible. And when we're talking about the intangible, we're talking about the psychological aspect of it. How well do I feel as a minority from Kogi State that I'm actually from Kogi State? You know, am I feeling, um, I, do I have a sense of belonging really? You know, uh, has my people uh, been opportune to govern the state um, since it was created? I mean, they have not, if, I, if they have not been able to govern the states, you know, am I integrated into um, development agenda? Do I have the benefits of governance? Am I enjoying it? If I'm enjoying it, really, I think I may not really bother about who, who is leading, you know, where the person comes from. After all, we are bonded by humanity. We are bonded by um, a sense of community, a sense of originating from the same geography, and of course, um, what I desire at the end of the day is the fruits of my surrendering my rights to the state and expecting to the state to protect me as a strength in the constitution, you know, which is that, you know, the welfare and security, my welfare and my security is guaranteed. I've surrendered my liberty, my rights to the state to protect it. It's only when is, I'm not protecting it well, um, when it's not being protected well, that like we've seen in ages, in years, that people start to agitate. You All know, right. this point um, has to be emphasized. And of course, it has been our pain, you know, governance, 
uh, should be about satisfying the needs and aspiration and aspirations of others, not my own. You know, but our own culture is just about the satisfaction of the self, family, and friends at the expense of the others, and that's why we're where we are. Well, we must thank you, Professor Abiodun Adeni, for taking our time to lend your thoughts to the conversation on Nigeria at 64. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Now, now, Mr. Ojo, just uh, before we allow you go, could we get your wish for Nigeria at 64 as we close the conversation? Well, my wish for Nigeria is that it ceases to be a crippled giant and that it takes its uh, rightful place in the Committee of Nations. And we cannot do this without a, a, a very uh, firm grasp of uh, innovation, technology, uh, and, and uh, what I would call, uh, you know, uh, technological advancement. Because irrespective of all these uh, arguments, look at our, our agriculture, our solid mineral, we still at that Help that we look up to the Western world to help us uh, to, to refine our products. We cannot uh, do value addition to, to our agricultural products. We are still exporting them raw. We export cocoa raw. We export all the, uh, I mean, ginger raw. The, if we are able to have technological breakthrough and we are able to be an industrial giant, that is what has made China a world power. It's not the 1.4 1. 1. billion population of China. It's not the 1.3 billion population of India. It's not the 250 million to 300 million population of US. What has made these countries that I mentioned industrial giants uh, to, to, to be respected in the community of nations is their economic and, and technological breakthrough. Look at how small Israel is. Israel is able to fight its enemies across its borders because it has technological breakthrough. Look at how they killed the, the head of Hezbollah last Friday. They didn't go inside uh, Lebanon. Just one missile was targeted. At, they bombed with position where the location where the man is. So we need industrial revolution. We need to catch up with the rest of the world. That is why it's irrespective of the fact that China is an autocracy, America is a democracy, uh, India is whatever it is, irrespective of their political system, the, the rest of the world respects them because of their technological breakthrough. Technological at, breakthrough. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Gide Ojo. As small as it is, it's able to command respect of the Committee of Nations because of its technological breakthrough. breakthrough. Thank you so very much, Mr. Gideo. We, we appreciate you. I'm afraid time will not permit for us to go any further, but we're hoping that we can have you again on the program and continue this conversation. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Do have a great week and uh, happy Independence Day ahead. Happy Independence Day to you as well. Thank you very much, sir. Now, Mr. Gideo Joe, a public affairs analyst, has harped on the need for technological breakthrough to ensure that Nigeria has its pride of place amongst the Committee of Nations. At 64, as we look towards political independence and some level of economic independence as well. Well, this is as much as time will permit on the program. Tomorrow, we'll would resume with a Democracy Day special broadcast of events highlighting our 64th anniversary celebrations.